Think. Act. <laughs> and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey, Rick. Glad to have you back. Daryl, delighted to be back. Uh, thank you. I like talking to your audience. And I like these conversations that we have. Yes, yes. It's definitely been a little while. Uh, we've we've had some moves uh, both ways in uranium, and uh, we've we've had some moves in physical gold. Uh, not not the equities yet, but today we're going to talk about a different concept, uh, which I want to dive into the psychology of self sabotage. <laughs> and <laughs> this is this is very important. So, like, I've I've watched a few wealthy guys that that really educate the YouTube community, educate many many different people. And one common theme that that I've heard from them is that they've amassed a they've gained a mass amount of wealth, and they lost it. And then they had to get on this journey to to regain that wealth and learn the lesson from that. And so I, I want to dive into that today because some of us may not have had a, a mass amount of wealth. Me personally, I, I've had the most wealth I've ever had, allowed myself to get into too much debt. And so I can I can understand uh, some of the psychology behind it. But I know you've mentioned that you've had some experience in your own uh, story. And so I, I wanted to see if you'd be willing to share that with us and, and if we can kind of look at the psychology behind that and and what decisions you made that that caused you to lose it and what decisions you made on the back end to gain the wealth back and, and also sustain it. I'm delighted to share that. Uh, I hope that my experience or my discussion uh, of my experience will uh, save people the <laughs> experience of giving it all back uh, in a bad sense. I want to start, too, by reminding your audience that wealth isn't all material. There isn't a requirement uh, that in order for you to attain self-satisfaction, that it all be material. Uh, and, I, and I want to say that you can lose non-material wealth, too. You can develop as a wonderful human being, uh, a learning machine, a satisfied human being. And, and as a consequence of self-sabotage, I suspect, as a, as a consequence perhaps of paying too much attention to the more crass elements of society, the popular press and envy, uh, you can lose non-material wealth just as fast uh, and just as detrimentally as you can material wealth. I'm not going to dwell on that too much, but I want to emphasize, first of all, that not all wealth is material and not all risks are material. But let's get back to what you asked me to talk about. As a young man, um, I had uh, an advantage that not many people share. Uh, I came from two families that had achieved entrepreneurial wealth. So I knew it was possible. Uh, I didn't have to look outside uh, of people who I knew because I was related to on both sides of the family. My mom's family were Italian immigrants. They came over with absolutely nothing, less than nothing. They came over with debts uh, and managed uh, in the United States uh, in, a couple, uh, in a couple occasions, a couple people, to generate uh, really substantial wealth from nothing as penniless immigrants. And, and on my father's side, the same circumstance. They didn't, uh, they came to the United States much, much, much earlier in the 1700s. Uh, but I was able to see a couple people on that side of the family uh, acquire wealth. But I was brought up by a single mother. Uh, and often the money ran out before the month ran out. <laughs> so I was brought up, I wouldn't say poor, we never wanted for food or anything like that. But I was brought up uh, knowing that while other people had it, we didn't, and it caused us tension. So I had a certain uh, hunger, I think, a certain desire that kids who were born rich, which I was not, didn't have. At the same time, uh, I had within my maternal and paternal family 
uh, evidence that through hard work and risk taking that I could change my circumstance. When I look back, that combination uh, of hunger and education was perfect. Uh, I had a drive personally in the late 60s that most kids didn't have. I started reading self-help books and books on investing and books on real estate when I was 15. And I began to employ the lessons when I was 15. Uh, I read a book called Pay Yourself First, which taught you that absolutely positively without fail, the first 10 cents of every dollar you made before you paid tax or bought a cup of coffee went into savings. And I learned too that you needed over time to invest those savings in a way where time was on your side, where the savings would compound, where you could become a capitalist so that your money worked for you even while you slept. The only way that I know of to become financially secure is to have your money working for you even when you're not working. <laughs> and I learned that at an early age. Uh, I also learned at an early age uh, the beauty of real estate investing. Uh, not now my primary occupation, but the idea that you could use leverage, prudent leverage, to acquire cash flow generating assets where over time your rents would increase, but your cost of capital, a fixed mortgage, didn't increase. <clears throat> Those were two very important lessons to me. Um, as I began to be successful, uh, I began to focus on natural resources. And Daryl, I had the incredible good luck to focus on natural resources at the beginning of the decade of the 1970s. So I lucked into, completely lucked into, the most incredible bull market and resources that the world has ever seen. And the consequence of that is that I became, relative to my upbringing, a very wealthy young man. I made the mistake, Daryl, that many young men make. I... Uh, because I think of testosterone, <laughs> the most dangerous compound in the world, by the way, uh, I conflated the success that I enjoyed as a consequence of a bull market and hard work with my being smart. <laughs> and I wasn't. I was lucky. Uh, I didn't understand either that markets work, that the cure for high prices is high prices, and that the cure for low prices is low prices. And I didn't understand the price of leverage. I didn't understand that while my cash flows and commodities were variable and ephemeral, my cost of debt service wasn't. It was fixed. <laughs> the consequence of all of that, Daryl, is that in the, in the decade of the 1970s, the oil price went from $3 to $30, and I thought I was smart. In 1982, the price of oil went from $30 to $12, and I learned just how smart I was, which is to say not very time out quick break in the action this message is brought to you by the rule symposium this annual symposium is hosted by the legendary investor rick rule himself it will take place from july 7th through 11th in boca raton florida mr rule invites some of the most brilliant minds in macroeconomics and natural resource investing this year featured speakers include danielle DiMartino booth nomi prince jim rickards Grant Williams, Lobo Tigre, and more. Rick even organizes the Living Legends panel where he invites individuals who have built billion dollar businesses from scratch. Attendees will be introduced to a myriad of companies active in the natural resources space, with the companies invited being the ones that Rick Rule invests in himself. The symposium is held at the Boca Raton, which is an amazing resort with exceptional amenities. I attended in 2023 and thoroughly enjoyed my time there. I went on an amazing cruise with Rick and other investors and CEOs of companies and even had the opportunity to test drive an Ashton Martin for the first time. So don't miss out on this opportunity to have fun and receive high quality education to help secure your financial future. Click the link below to sign up and I promise you won't regret it. But if you do, Rick offers an amazing money back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Click the link below to sign up today. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the content. Uh, at $30, my, pre, my pre, free cash flow and my debt service capabilities were spectacular. And I thought I was a blue-eyed chic, you know? 
uh, when the price of oil went from $30 to $12, my ability to service my debt went away, but my debt did not go away. So I went from being a very wealthy young man to having a negative net worth measured in the millions. Uh, my investment goal on my birthday in 1982 was to get myself back to broke. I knew that I had the earnings capability that if I could get myself back to broke, I could succeed. But I didn't understand how I was going to be able to get back to broke. <clears throat> and I did something that was very smart, that I'm very proud of, that inures to my benefit today. Uh, I got all of my creditors together, <laughs> uh, the bank uh, and five private creditors, on one phone call. And I said, I'm not going to walk. I'm going to work this out, but you all are going to have to give me some time. Uh, if one of you steps out of line, uh, I'm going to have to go BK, which means none of you are going to get paid. And so I'm introducing you all to each other so that we can work out a plan where as I make money, I can service my debts rateably, all of you, and, and where all of you get to know each other so that you support me in this process. I didn't walk. Uh, and it took me four years to dig myself out of a hole, to get myself just back to broke. An interesting thing happened, though. The creditors, who normally probably would have been angry for the circumstance that they found themselves in, the fact that I was unable at that point in time to service my debt, first of all, received back every dime that I owed them, principal and interest. The other thing that happened is that uh, their appreciation of me, the fact that I worked myself out of that, uh, meant that they showed me opportunities, they gave me opportunities that aided me in the process of not being broke. One of those five creditors became, uh, to this day, my most important client. Uh, that person uh, is now dead, but I do business with his grandchildren. So the, bro the fact that I didn't walk away, that I didn't declare bankruptcy, the fact that I didn't say too bad, so sad, the fact that, and, and, and it gave me four years of penury, the fact that I made the sacrifice uh, and I believed enough in myself and I also believed in the sanctity of the contract I had with them meant that somebody who had inadvertently became my victim uh, became a beneficiary and my biggest single backer. And I think that's important. Uh, I, I think it's really, really important. Now, how did I go broke? Um. I developed too much hubris. I conflated luck with capability. I became incautious. I borrowed too much relative to my ability to service the debt. And I didn't understand the nature of the world, which is that the cure for low prices is always low prices and the cure for high prices is always high prices. The consequence of that, Daryl, is in 2022, I was coming on your show saying, Listen, the uranium price is too low. It has to go up. I learned that when I went broke. I learned that when prices get too high, they fall. When prices get too low, they rise. Had I not experienced that personally and viscerally, it would not have become instinctive. And I would have missed the bull market in uranium that you and I both just enjoyed. Most people who've never had this experience don't understand the dynamics of markets. They don't understand the dynamics of pricing. Most people are anti-contrarian. Most people look at a narrative and they see the narrative supported by price increases and the price increases justify or validate the narrative. But the increase in price has reduced the value of the narrative. Yes, the uranium narrative was true, at $100, just like it was true at $20, but the price didn't have to go up anymore. Uh, somebody who has been through what I went through, if they learned their lessons, are attracted to the realities of a market. They're contrarians. They're attracted to hate. 
And importantly, they've come to understand the time value of money. You need to invest in things where time is on your side and your personal financial structure needs to benefit from time. That doesn't mean that you don't borrow. <clears throat> it means that you borrow in prudent amounts and you maintain enough personal liquidity <clears throat> so that if something goes wrong, you can sustain yourself. You absolutely positively borrow to buy a rental house in a down market or to buy a rental house that hasn't been well maintained, where you can increase the value simply by painting it, repairing what's wrong, and mowing the lawn. You buy a rental house where you believe that you can increase the rents at five or six percent compounded while your 30 while your 30-year mortgage stays fixed. In other words, you buy like Robert like Robert Kawasaki suggests to create cash flow for yourself, but not negative cash flow. <laughs> yeah, that's, those, that's... Are, those are all really important lessons. You know, when I was a young man, Daryl, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is important no, no. too. When I was a young man, when I had lots of time on earth left, I was real impatient. Uh, I wanted something to happen within two, th two months or three months or four months. And I thought that the fact that I wanted something to happen was relevant, <laughs> but it didn't. <laughs> Your wants don't matter to the world. Now that I'm 71 years of age and I have much less time left on earth, I'm much more patient. Uh, I think paradoxically in five or six year terms, not because I don't wish that things would happen quickly, more quickly, but rather because I've learned over the course of my life that money is made in compounding and compounding takes time. I remember buying a rental house as a young man in Vancouver, British Columbia. If my memory serves me right, I paid $21,000 for that house. Uh, it was a triplex and it had a, a, a pretty beat up bachelor suite in the basement, but I was a pretty beat up bachelor. So I lived down there <laughs> and the two nicer units upstairs paid the mortgage. I don't own that house anymore, but it sold fairly recently for a million four. Uh, if my memory serves me correct, I had a $5,000 down payment on that house. The house carried itself. Had I wished, uh, I could have owned that house with $5,000 uh, invested. I could have financed the $5,000 out of that house and ended up with a house worth a million four. Now, that process would have taken from 1974 to 2022, but the truth is I would have enjoyed rental income the whole time. The point of all this is if you are intelligently leveraged in cash flow generating assets where time is on your side, not your enemy, you can't help but make money. You literally cannot help but make money. And I think you start the process in a way that you and I discussed uh, on your show two years ago. You start by reading three books. You read the book Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt. Don't just buy the book. You got to buy it and read it <laughs> and think about it. Economics in One Lesson tells you the way the world really works, not the way that CNBC or President Biden or Governor Grimsley uh, want you to believe, but the way the world really works, uh, the fact that markets work. And then after you've read that book, you go get yourself a book and you can borrow it at the library. You don't have to buy it if you don't have any money. You get the book, The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. This is relative to the effort required to read it, the best investment book ever written. It's important that you invest in yourself, in your education before you risk much money uh, because it's important that you don't do what I did, <laughs> which is ready, fire, aim. You know, you do ready, aim, fire. And that starts with The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham, particularly the chapters on the margin of safety and Mr. Market, the importance of being a contrarian. And if that book has been relatively easy for you, then you read the book Securities Analysis, also by Ben Graham. If you read Securities Analysis and if you employ the lessons in Security Analysis, you will become rich over time. Guaranteed. No questions about it. The caveat is that you have to understand the book and you have to employ the lessons over time. 
So somebody who cares about becoming materially rich has to start by investing in themselves, by reading and understanding those three books. Yes, yes, that's that's very powerful, man. Uh, you mentioned a lot of a lot of good gems in there, <clears throat> and you know, one a few things that I pulled out is so when you first built your wealth, um, the price of oil went from three dollars to thirty dollars, and then back down to twelve. Yep, and I, I, it immediately makes me think of Warren Buffett's rule: don't lose money. Right. I think I think that was the first and second rule. His yeah. first and second rule. I remember Buffett's lost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But he's lost money he could afford to lose. And he did it within a structure where he had a lot of liquidity and he had a lot of things that worked. When Buffett says don't lose money, uh, he neglects to point out that he lost a billion dollars in the air, air in, in airline business. But yeah. uh he bet on probabilities. So the circumstances where he made money were substantially greater. Than where they lost money. It, it, take only risks that you can afford to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's good. And so, uh, so and and reason I mention that is sometimes we see um, like you and I we've had talks off yeah. offline about uranium, mm -hmm. and you were like, "Hey, you may want to consider taking some profits off the table, right? Um, you know, things don't go up in a straight line." And then, uh, in in that terms, like I think that, you know, and that uh, that you could have probably preserved a lot more capital, you know, in that situation. And that's kind of what I'm getting from there. Yep. Another another thing that you mentioned is that you started reading and educating yourself at the age of 15, which that I see that as planting seeds uh, that that would grow later on. And you also just gave us three amazing books to check out. And it, it reminds me of the statistic that um, building wealth and becoming financially free is 20% knowledge and 80% behavior. And so, uh, like. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's true. It's true. Yes, yes. I, and so, I just uh, had to laugh because of my past bad behavior. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, like for those that are watching this, that are accumulating the knowledge to watch Rick all the time, watch my show. Uh, read a lot of books is 20% head knowledge and 80% behavior. So you have to, you have to have the discipline. Uh, you know this what? also reminded let's, me, let's, go let's ahead, talk go a, ahead. Little, a little bit more about behavior. That brings up something. Mm -hmm. Don't look for excuses to fail. Don't look for excuses to fail. There's all kinds of things out there that could cause you to quit. You could make a couple of mistakes and you say, you could say, I'm not cut out to this. Ridiculous. We've all made mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes. Don't look for reasons to fail. A woman might say, this is a man's world. I can't succeed because I'm a woman. Bullshit. Get to it. Half the world's population are women. And those people are looking for you to succeed, not to fail. I can't fail because I'm black. You know, white people don't want to do business with me or some shit like that. Remember what Malcolm X said, uh, the black community taken to itself in the United States is the eighth wealthiest nation in the world. Are things harder? Absolutely. Is that an excuse to fail? Absolutely not. Uh, politics. I can't succeed because of the Democrats. You know, I can't succeed because of Governor Inslee or President Biden. Ridiculous. They don't know who you are. You succeed to, dis to spite them. Don't look for excuses to fail. Uh, read the Elon Musk book uh, about and I'm not trying to say that you should be a maniac like Elon Musk. What I'm trying to say is that you develop this mindset that says, within my own value system, uh, within what I want to accomplish, within my time frames, within my capabilities, I want to look for ways to succeed. I don't want to look. I want. To, I don't want to look for ways to fail. I've known a lot of people in my life, Daryl, who wanted to achieve financially what I achieved. And who were smarter than me. But they didn't get there because their mind was focused. Uh, I don't know what it was focused on, uh, but they defeated themselves. They said, I can't succeed because of the Republicans or I can't succeed because of the Democrats uh, or I, I, I can't succeed for this reason or I can't succeed for that reason or I wasn't built, born into a wealthy family uh, or I, I had to drop out of school. None of that matters. 
None of that matters. You put your finger on this behavior. Save. You know, uh, getting wealthy is not about living wealthy. It's not about a fancy pair of tennis shoes. It's not about a, a treat at Starbucks. It's not about a fancy car. It's about paying yourself first. It's about compounding. It's about changing your behavior. It's about doing what you're doing, investing in yourself and your own reputation, building a personal brand. What you're doing right now with these podcasts, becoming known as a thinking moral human being and building the Daryl Thomas brand is the most important thing that you can do. That's behavior. Yes, yes, agreed. And yeah, it's it really starts with that mindset, you know, how you come in. If you come in with a defeated mindset, you're going to get defeated if you if you think that. Like, because me, honestly, like I, whether you white, whoever, you trying to hold me back, like get get the, out the way, right? I'm, yes. I'm coming through and I'm, I'm going to succeed and I'm going to do what I need to do for, for me and mine. So it's it's it definitely starts with a mindset. If you're starting off with a defeated mindset, you're going to defeat yourself. That's and, that's. And, 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 if there's people out there who are toxic to you, ignore them they get cut off if they're family if they're family it doesn't matter i mean you could you could give them a hug in thanksgiving but don't let them malcolm x said uh do not allow your self-image to be determined by somebody who has an interest in demeaning you Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that isn't that isn't a remark about race that's a remark about the human condition yes Uh, it's just really, really, really important that you not allow your self-image to be determined by your current status in life or the opinion of other people, particularly people who have an interest in demeaning you. And there's a lot of envious people out there. There's a lot of people who are going to resent your success. That's okay. Let them do it. Just <laughs> don't let it affect your own self-image. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. There's there's a... Um... There's a good song by one of my favorite artists, Kendrick Lamar. It's called Cut You Off. And he talks about uh, he talks about even having to cut off family. Like sometimes family want to run you up a tree, you know. And so uh, it's that's one of my was one of my favorite songs. Uh, another couple points I wanted to just point out before we close out. Uh, one one thing you mentioned was the uh, you didn't burn the bridge between the 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 bankers and the people that the the creditors people that gave you gave you uh money or credit and that ended up turning into a fruitful relationship down the line that benefited both parties Mm -hmm. because you took responsibility for the situation that you got yourself in and you didn't burn the bridge instead you worked through it and and many people can appreciate that like even if someone you know say um owes you money a lot of times you just want communication like hey where you at you know like don't just block my calls and then disappear off the face of the earth right come communicate with me let me know your situation so that we can work through this together right and so uh that's that was that was amazing that she mentioned that and then um another point is the i've been reading the book by john maxwell the 16 laws of communication and he talks about the law of anticipation and he makes a distinguishment uh, he distinguishes between anticipation and discipline how discipline is uh, you discipline yourself to get a particular um, result but when you anticipate you anticipate the results that come from discipline and so it seems like you had the discipline but then you also anticipated like in the future this is where my life will be if i continue to be disciplined in this matter in this in this manner and so that that was one another thing I wanted to highlight. And part of that discipline, I think, comes to know comes from learning and having a discussion with yourself about what you want, what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you know about, and focusing your efforts there. One of the things that's made me a successful investor, Daryl, is I got no fear of missing out. If there's somebody over there who's making a fortune in technology stocks, whether or not he understands technology, uh, I'm delighted that he made the money, but I'm not going to go there because I don't have any competitive advantage in technology. I don't know what Microsoft is worth. You know, I don't know what Google's worth. 
I'm delighted that people make money at it, but I'm not going to go over there uh, because I don't understand how to do it. And I think it's really important for people to know what they know, uh, know what they need to know, and to be disciplined and anticipate success that's realistic given who you are, what you want to accomplish, and what you know how to do. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think, too, Daryl, it's important that you understand where money comes from. Money comes from serving your customer. Money comes from generating enough utility that somebody is willing to pay you for what you do uh, and uh, give you some of their utility. <laughs> mm -hmm. And wealth really is the delta between the utility that you generate, that is the services or goods that you provide to other people, minus the utility that you consume yourself. <laughs> That's really what wealth is. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't get that. They have this sort of ephemeral sense of money. You know, I want money. Okay. Produce more than you consume and you're going to have money and then don't lose it. <laughs> don't lose that damn delta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that is true. Uh, so as we wrap up, Rick, uh, thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, you have a few things coming up. You have a boot camp coming up and then you have the Royal Symposium coming up this year. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity to share about those briefly and then uh, we'll close out. I got five things that I oh, help, yeah, you got more than that. <laughs> more that than I help two. your people that I hope help your folks generate wealth. The first is, of course, uh, Rural Investment Media. If you are a natural resource investor, go to ruralinvestmentmedia.com and list your natural resource stocks. I will personally rank them for free, no obligation. Once you want to invest in yourself, not just in stocks, go to the Rural Classroom, where I have two hundred hours of instructional programming, including soon this interview. Uh, this is absolutely free, uh, and you can invest in yourself as a natural resource investor. You apply that education at events like the boot camp, uh, an eight and a half hour long online symposium, where you take a deep dive into one aspect of natural resource investing. The next one, April 20th, is about exploration and prospect generation. Costs $99. You'll have access to the recordings for a year. And you'll need access to the recordings because we're going to give you more information in eight and a half hours than you can absorb in eight and a half hours. Uh, you can do this from the com comfort of your own home. Cost $99. If for any reason you don't think that I gave you $99 worth of content, email me and I'll give you your money back. My granddaddy event, and you know this, Daryl, you've been there, the Natural Resources Investment Symposium in Boca Raton, California, uh, Florida. This is simply the best natural resources conference in the world. You can attend in person, which I recommend, because there's a lot of communication that can't be recorded. But if you can't come to Boca Raton, you can attend online like 1,300 other people did last year. In any case, you will get access to big, pic big picture thinkers, the Jim Rickards, the Daniela DiMartina Booths, the Nomi Princes, people who talk to you about the world the way it really is, not the way that CNBC or Joe Biden or Angela Merkel want you to believe it is. You'll have access to analysts who've made money in natural resources for 30 years or 40 years. You'll have access to the living legends, the Robert Friedlands of the world. Uh, and you'll be able to watch them walk around the exhibit hall and pay attention to who they talk to and what questions they ask. Once again, whether you attend online or in person, there's a gold-plated money-back guarantee. If you don't think you got your money's worth, you email me. I'd appreciate it if you tell me what I did wrong, how I could serve you better. But there's no obligation that you do that. Absolute money-back guarantee. Now, I'm delighted to say in 30 years of money-back guarantees around educational products, I've had to refund a little less than one-tenth of one percent of my tuitions. That's how good the curriculum is. Finally, by the way, uh, all of you need banks to prosper. And if your current bank isn't serving you well, uh, I'm starting a new one. This will be the seventh that I've been involved in. It's called Battle Bank. Uh, we uh, built a bank years ago, which I think you remember, Daryl, called Everbank. We built it from zero to $28 billion in deposits, sold it to TIAA Cref. Uh, they've moved on, uh, and we're moving on too. We're going to serve that. Uh, we're going to serve that group again. If you, if you believe you deserve interest on your checking account, which I do. <laughs> 
but your bank doesn't. Think about Everbank. If you want to borrow prudently to buy a duplex or a fourplex, if you want to own a duplex or a fourplex in your IRA, if you don't think your IRA is merely a repository for mutual funds or something like that, come to Battle Bank. If you want to finance your precious metals holdings prudently, come to Battle Bank. If for any reason you aren't happy with your current bank, check out battlebank.com or go to Rural Investment Media in the question and comment section, write bank and we'll hook you up. Yes, yes. A lot of value, a lot of value that you are providing there. I will be sure to link to those in the description below. Uh, be sure to check out the boot camp, Rural Investment Media, as well as the symposium and Battle Bank. Uh, thank you, Rick, for coming back on. Daryl, always a pleasure. This is a really interesting conversation. It's something I don't get to talk about a lot. And it's something I'm really passionate about. Uh, I really hope that I can help people avoid some of the mistakes I made. Uh, because when people individually become wealthier, the world becomes wealthier too. I'd love to leave the world a little bit better than the way I found it. Hey, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. All right. Take care, man. Thank you, sir.